Greetings again from isolation, uh, still under quarantine because of the uh, coronavirus. And not to get too real, but all this talking about um, diseases and quarantines uh, made me think about a work of art uh, that's closely associated with uh, the plague in the 16th century. Um, I am going to show you a close look and an analysis of Titian's Pieta. Uh, for those of you uh, in my classes, this is chapter five of your textbook. Uh, and let's just go to my slides and let's see what we can learn. All right, so the work of art is by Titian. He was a very, very famous uh, and successful painter in the late Renaissance. Uh, the title and subject of the art is Pieta. That's Latin. It means pity or lamentation, mourning. It's a work of art that depicts Mary and um, her mourners holding and grieving over the crucified body of Christ. Uh, this work of art was done in 1576, uh, and it's actually one of the last paintings that uh, Titian ever made. Uh, it's a very large piece, too. Um, to see it in comparison to a human figure, you can see it's about, um, about 11 and a half feet tall, and today it hangs in the Academia Gallery in, Flor or, excuse me, in Venice, uh, which is the city where Titian lived. Uh, actually, against this back wall here, you can see a picture of a work of art I looked at previously, um, the Last Supper slash Feast in the House of Levi. Uh, over here, you can see the Pieta. Uh, not a great picture, but uh, at least you can kind of see how it looks to scale. It's also interesting that in the gallery, they hung it on the right-hand side because originally uh, Titian painted this for a church where he was to be entombed. You would approach it on the right-hand wall, and the composition is laid out as if you were approaching it that way. Uh, there's this very strong sort of push, a very strong diagonal push from right to left with all of the grievers and mourners sort of carrying your eye in that direction. Uh, so let's break this down and let's kind of see who's who. There's a lot of figures in this piece. Um, central, of course, is the deceased body of Christ uh, being held by his mother, Mary. And, uh, well, first I need to apologize. The quality of my slide isn't the best. But honestly, this is a pretty rough work of art. Uh, it's not painted very distinctly. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that Titian left this in somewhat of an unfinished state. Uh, but here we have Christ being held by his mother uh, and two mourners. Uh, this over here, the blonde woman, is Mary Magdalene. And this man here we'll get to in a moment. Uh, other figures include two angels, one here and one here, both with black wings, uh, sort of like little angels of death. This one holds a candle, a very long one, almost more like a torch. And this angel is bent over holding a jar, possibly an anointing jar. On the right-hand side is a figure holding a cross and wearing a crown of thorns. She is Hellespontine. She's a Sibyl, a pagan figure who foretold the coming of Christ. So she represents the New Testament. Representing the Old Testament is a statue of Moses, uh, identifiable by his tablet, his staff, and also the fact that he has small horns protruding from his head. Uh, that's kind of a story for a different day. Um, but let's take a look at the figure on the bottom right. Who, who is that? Uh, and to answer that, we have to look both at the tradition of art history, but also... Um, perhaps a little bit of Bible trivia. What old man would have been present at the crucifixion? Well, typically a pieta, uh, when it follows biblical tradition, shows uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, who typically wears blue, uh, Mary Magdalene, who uh, does not wear a veil, her head is uncovered, um, and she usually sits near Christ's feet. Uh, and the man in the work of art in a traditional Pieta is uh, St. John the Evangelist. Uh, he's identifiable because uh, he's often depicted as a very young man, uh, usually, in fact, very feminine. But if we look at this person here, this is an older person. He doesn't really fit the bill for uh, John the Evangelist, according to traditional art historical interpretations. Could he be Joseph? 
like from the Christmas story, the stepfather of Christ. Um, that's not likely. Uh, Joseph is not named among the mourners at Christ's crucifixion. In fact, he's kind of falls out of the Bible entirely after the um, after Jesus's uh, childhood. And it's thought that Joseph was probably uh, deceased by the time that Jesus was a man. So that old man in Pieta, probably not this guy. Uh, it's possible that it could be Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus. Uh, they're two older figures. They do factor into this later part of Jesus' story, but usually they show up a little bit later during the deposition uh, whenever they are entombing Christ. Uh, also, Joseph of Arimathea, while he does have a white beard, usually wears a turban. That's one of his attributes. Um, and the person in the painting wears red. And as a matter of fact, he looks very, very much like the typical depiction of St. Jerome. Uh, a red cloak, uh, bare-chested, looking like an ascetic. Uh, St. Jerome is uh, the person who translated the Bible into Latin. He is the author of the Vulgate translation of the Bible. Um, and this guy definitely looks like St. Jerome. Uh, the trouble is that St. Jerome certainly wasn't alive at the death of Christ. He died in the 5th century. Uh, there is plenty of tradition of placing more or less modern saints in um, in Pieta paintings. Uh, but in this one, it's such a personal one. This doesn't look like a vision. This looks like a one-on-one -on -one interaction with Jesus. But he is usually identified as Saint Jerome. But there's another way to take a look at this. That old man with the pointed beard looks an awful lot like Titian himself. Uh, take a look at the painting on the right. That's a self-portrait done about, about nine years or so earlier. Um, and yeah, you can see that the resemblance is really striking. Titian has painted himself. And look at what he's doing. He's uh, sort of on his knees. And you can see that his left hand gently holds Jesus's hand. And his right hand is up and sort of braced against his upper arm. And he's looking very eagerly into Jesus's face. He has this sort of probing, searching look. And it's interesting because, as I said, you would approach this painting from the right-hand side. And that's the way that the figure is approaching in the painting. Again, my slide quality really sucks. But you can see that his leg and his foot are sort of trailing off the edge of the canvas. And it creates this really eerie sensation as though Titian has climbed into the painting, painted himself as among Christ's mourners. And as I said, uh, this work of art was done in 1576. And if you were to look up what was happening in Titian's home city of Venice in 1576, you'd read that this work of art was painted during an outbreak of the plague. A third of the citizens of Venice died during the plague. And um, as a matter of fact, Titian himself was struck. Uh, he is recorded as dying of a fever in 1576 and it's quite possible that it was the plague that carried him off. He was, an, uh, as I said, a very old man at this time. Uh, we don't know Titian's birth date, but he would have been uh, definitely in his 80s, uh, maybe even as old as 100. But something else that sort of lends to the uh, supposition that this is a self-portrait as opposed to a portrait of Jerome has to do with another little detail here at the base of Hellespontine. It's very hard to make out, but there's a painting within the painting. It's a small panel, and it's leaned up against the base of this sculpture. And if you look behind it, that's actually the Titian's family's crest, their seal. And the painting shows, well, Titian, the artist, and a young man kneeling and praying to another Pieta. Um, this is probably a sort of a prayer, a sort of a votive prayer. And almost certainly what we're seeing here is Titian and his son praying to the Virgin Mary. And the reason why uh, he would be especially devout is because... 
as I said, this work of art was painted during an outbreak of the plague. And we actually know that uh, his son, Orezio, uh, was also stricken with the plague and sadly uh, died shortly after his father did. And so this work of art becomes very personal because it shows a father worrying and grieving possibly over his son, over the loss of his loved ones, and sort of crawling into his own painting. And I just can't shake this sort of chilling idea that Titian has climbed into the painting and then died there. It's kind of eerie. And as I said, this work of art is rather unfinished. It's very loose, very brushy. Part of this might have to do with the fact that he was such an old man. His eyesight was failing and his hand was unsteady. But, um, I mean, he's painting this for his tomb. The idea of finishing it might have seemed a little macabre to him. And if you look at the very base of the painting... Um, it says that this work of art was left unfinished, and uh, it reads, What Titian left undone, Palma reverently finished. Uh, that is certainly Palma Giovanni, who was one of Titian's assistants. Uh, he worked on the painting after his master's death, and uh, we believe that this little angel up here with the black wings is actually not by Titian's hand, but in fact was painted by uh, Titian's assistant after Titian's death. So it's a very poignant, very sad painting about loss and grieving. And I think whenever you place this piece in the context of a city that's dying of an outbreak of this disease, it becomes uh, very personal and very tragic. Oh, so... Oh, look, my antivirus. <laughs> so I hope I didn't bum you out a little bit too much. But uh, again, it's a very interesting and very poignant work of art. Uh, I enjoy uh, reading about it, and I hope that you enjoyed listening about it. Thanks for your time.